Turn with me to 2 Kings. Let's turn it on. Turn with me to 2 Kings, chapter 9. And we're going to look at uh, this chapter, but we'll start out looking at the first part and then work our way through, like we have done in some of these longer chapters. Starting in verse 1. Then Elisha the prophet called one of the sons of the prophets and said to him, Tie up your garments and take this flask of oil in your hand and go to Ramoth Gilead. And when you arrive, look there for Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, son of Nimshi, and go in and have him rise from among his fellows and lead him to an inner chamber. Then take the flask of oil and pour it on his head and say, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then open the door and flee, do not linger. So the young man, the servant of the prophet, went to Ramoth Gilead. And when he came, behold, the commanders of the army were in council. And he said, I have the word for you, O commander. And Jehu said, To which of us all? And he said, To you, O commander. So he arose and went into the house. And the young man poured the oil on his head, saying to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of Israel, I appoint you king over the people of the Lord, over Israel. And you shall strike down the house of Ahab, your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants, the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off from Ahab every male, bond or free in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha, the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. Then he opened the door and fled. When Jehu came out to the servants of his master, they said to him, Is all well? Why did this mad fellow come to you? (laughs) And he said to them, You know the fellow and his talk. And they said, That is not true. Tell us now. And he said, Thus and so he spoke to me, saying, Thus says the Lord, I anoint you king over Israel. Then in haste every man of them took his garments and put them under him on the bare steps. And they blew the trumpet and proclaimed, Jehu is king. Let us pray. Father, we see in... In this chapter, 2 Kings, you, you bringing your vengeance and wrath against the idolatrous house of Ahab. And we know from Scripture that there will be a day when you will bring finally justice, wrath, and vengeance against all of those who have sinned against you and have not acknowledged you as the true Lord and come to Jesus. We pray that you would open our eyes to this reality more strongly. To see not only the grace we have received in Christ, but if anyone does not know Jesus, that you would open their eyes to their dire need. In Jesus' name, amen. The ACLJ, American Center for Liberty and Justice, recently reported that a week ago a number of Nigerian Christians murdered by Islamic radicals had tripled to more than 1,200. The article said, we warned you that the deadly violence wasn't showing signs of slowing down. This week it's now closer to 1,300 Christian men, women, and children who had been targeted for death or their faith. It was just reported that Islamic extremists killed 33 more Christians in about 24 hours. In a Blitzkrieg attack, radical Islamic Thulani herdsmen in armored trucks and motorcycles stormed Christian villages, gunning down helpless victims and burning down homes. When we read these kind of reports from various places around the world of Christians that are being persecuted, And we cry out to God for this to be stopped, an important prayer. Now that's an appropriate response. And God says that He is our avenger. In fact, Deuteronomy 32, 35 states, Vengeance is mine and recompense. 
to the time when their foot shall slip, to the day of their calamity is hand, and their doom comes swiftly. There will be a day when God brings ultimate justice. Similarly, Deuteronomy 32:43 states, He avenges the blood of his children and takes vengeance on his adversaries. He repays those who hate him and cleanses his people's land. Well, our text this morning is a prime example of God bringing his justice to the house of Ahab. And this gives us hope that ultimate justice will be done in the world. We see this with the house of Ahab, and the Bible tells us there will be a final time of justice when Christ returns. And this text does give us some characteristics of God's vengeance on the house of Ahab. Now the story of God's vengeance on the house of Ahab starts with God, through his prophets, Elisha and his servant, anointing Jehu to be an instrument of of his justice. We see the first ten verses of this chapter dealing with that which we just read. And this action completed a work God had given Elijah to do. You may remember that God had instructed Elijah to anoint three people, Elisha, Haziel, and Jehu in 1 Kings 19. Now he did manage to anoint Elisha, of course, to be his successor, Haziel and Jehu. Well, a little bit later, but Paul House comments that Jehu must still become king. Jezebel must die, and Ahab's descendants must perish, just like Elijah had prophesied. And we see in verses 11 through 13, again, which we just read, that as soon as Jehu's officers heard the news, they spread their garments beneath his feet, blew their trumpets, and acknowledged him as king. Jehu was God's chosen instrument to bring God's vengeance on the house of Ahab. Philip Ryken comments about the house of Ahab. He said, if ever a royal couple deserved the wrath of God, it was Ahab and Jezebel, who were greedy, vicious, scheming idolaters. Ahab and Jezebel turned away from God to worship Baal. They killed God's prophets. They seized property that did not belong to them. The Bible thus summarizes Ahab's reign by saying that he, quote, did more to provoke the Lord, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him, in 1 Kings 16.33. It would not have been wholly and just for God to let all these sins go unpunished. Reichen mentions... There are at least five important lessons in 2 Kings 9 about the justice and vengeance of God, and we're going to consider these five as we go through this passage. First, God's vengeance is thorough. In terms of the house of Ahab, God told Jehu to kill every last son of Ahab in the kingdom. Verses 7 through 9, And you shall strike down the house of Ahab your master, so that I may avenge on Jezebel the blood of my servants the prophets, and the blood of all the servants of the Lord. For the whole house of Ahab shall perish, and I will cut off the Ahab every male bond are three in Israel. And I will make the house of Ahab like the house of Jeroboam the son of Nebat, and like the house of Basha the son of Ahijah. And the dogs shall eat Jezebel in the territory of Jezreel, and none shall bury her. And the servant, speaking of him, he, then he opened the door and fled. Uh, God was going to completely wipe out the house of Ahab. Second, God's vengeance is personal. God knows the particular sins of individuals, and they will receive an exact judgment for their sin. In this text, God singled out Ahab and Jezebel for judgment. In fact, mentions that she won't be buried, the dogs will eat her. Uh, we see a pattern throughout Scripture of the wicked kings, those wicked, the, uh, they'll either be eaten by wild animals or the birds of prey. In fact, years before this, Elijah had made the same prophecy. In 1 Kings 21 23, he prophesies of Jezebel, the dog shall eat Jezebel within the walls of Jezreel. God saw that Jezebel had, eaten, had, had worshiped Baal. He knew she had slaughtered his prophets. She heard her death threats against Elijah. 
He witnessed her plot to murder Naboth and steal his vineyard when Ahab coveted the vineyard. God held her accountable for these sins. An important application of the omnipresence of God is that we are always in God's immediate presence. Through God's people this can be a point of great comfort. It's also an incentive against sin. Remember any sin you commit is done in the full presence of God. And think of that the next time you're tempted towards some particular sin. Third, God's vengeance is deadly. God is perfectly and absolutely just. In the case of the house of Ahab, God brought justice to them in this life and of course in eternity. Ahab was killed in the battle of Ramoth Gilead. His son Joram was the next to die. And we see in verses 14 through 16, Thus Jehu, the son of Jehoshaphat, the son of Nimshi, conspired against Joram. Now Joram, with all Israel, had been on guard at Ramoth Gilead against Haziel, king of Syria. But King Joram had returned to be healed in Jezreel of the wounds that the Syrians had given him when he fought with Haziel, king of Syria. So Jehu said, if, if this is your decision, then let no one slip out of the city and go and tell the news in Jezreel. Then Jehu mounted his chariot and went to Jezreel, for Joram lay there. And Ahaziah, king of Judah, had come down to visit Joram. Now the watchman was standing on the tower in Jezreel. And he saw the company at Jehu as he came and said, I see a company. And Joram said, Take a horseman and send to meet him, and let him say, Is it peace? So a man on a horseback went out to meet him and said, Thus says the king, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride with me. And the watchman reported, saying, The messenger reached them, but he's not coming back. Then he sent out a second horseman who came to them and said, Thus the king says, Is it peace? And Jehu said, What do you have to do with peace? Turn around and ride with me. Again the watchman reported, He reached them, but he's not coming back. And the driving is, dry, is the driving like Jehu, the son of Nimshi, for he drives furiously. Apparently they knew him by his driving style. <laughs> Joram said, Make ready. And they made ready his chariot. Then King Joram, king of Israel, and Ahaziah, king of Judah, set out, each in his chariot, and went to meet Jehu, and met him at the property of Naboth, the Jezreelite. And when Joram saw Jehu, he said, Is it peace, Jehu? He said, What peace can there be so long as the whorings and sorceries of your mother Jezebel are so many? Then Joram reigned about and fled, saying to Ahaziah, Treachery, O Ahaziah. And Jehu drew his bow with his full strength and shot Joram between the shoulders, so that the arrow pierced his heart, and he sank in his chariot. Jehu said to Bidkar, his aide, Take him up and throw him on the plot of ground belonging to Naboth, Naboth, a Jezreelite. For remember when you and I rode side by side behind Ahab, his father, and how the Lord made this pronouncement against him. As surely as I saw yesterday the blood of Naboth and the blood of his sons, declares the Lord, I will repay you on this plot of ground. Now therefore take him up and throw him on the plot of the ground in accordance with the word of the Lord. Well, one by one the messengers joined with Jehu. And Jehu was recognized by his driving habits. Joram decided to find out what was going on and went out to meet him. When Joram realized he was in danger he just tried to quickly retreat and escape. But of course Jehu shot him the arrow. This isn't treachery but justice and the fulfillment made by Elijah. Uh, what is quoted is the prophecy made in 1 Kings 21, 17 to 24. Ahaziah, the king of Judah, was the next to die. 
Verse 27. When Ahaziah, the king of Judah, saw this, he fled in the direction of Beth Hagan, and Jehu pursued him and said, Shoot him also. And they, sh and they shot him in the chariot at the ascent of Gur, which is by Ebliam. And he fled to Megiddo and died there. His servants carried him in a chariot to Jerusalem and buried him in his tomb with the fathers in the city of David. In the eleventh year of Joram, the son of Ahab, Ahaziah began to reign over Judah. Give you a little history of that. This mentions that Ahaziah had come to see, in 2 Kings 8, 29, it mentions that Ahaziah had come to see Joram as he recovered from the wounds he received. And like Joram, Ahaziah also received God's judgment, another wicked king. Fourth thing we see is that God's vengeance is just. The Bible declares that everything God does is righteous and just. By the end of this story, every member of Ahab's household has received what they deserved. In 2 Kings 9.22, uh, we see the, the Jehu killing uh, Joram. All the spiritual adultery, the fertility cults, the sorcery, the idolatry, the murder that had continued during this time unabated. When Joram and Ahaziah received death from Jehu, they were receiving perfect justice from God. And as we mentioned, they also received judgment as they entered into God's presence in eternity. Jezebel also receives perfect justice. She was defenestrated, to use the technical word. That word means throwing a politician out the window <laughs> and, or, or off the wall. And uh, actually, it's what started the Thirty Years' War in the 1600s. But uh, some politicians were thrown out of the window. They, they didn't die. They landed on a great big pile of horse dung. It was being stored up there for um, fertilizer. Uh, Jezebel didn't have the pile to land on. But uh, we uh, see in verses 30 to 33, when Jehu came to Jezreel, Jezebel heard of it. And she painted her eyes and adorned her head and looked out the window. And as Jehu entered the gate, he said, Is it peace, uh, you Zimri, murderer of your master? And he lifted up his face to the window and said, Who is on my side? Who? Two or three eunuchs looked out at him. He said, Throw her down. So they threw her down, and some of their blood splattered the wall and on the horses, and they trampled on her. Then he went in and ate and drank. And he said, Now see to this cursed woman and bury her, for she is a king's daughter. When they went to bury her, they found no more of her than, her than the skull and the feet and the palms of their hands. When they came back and told him, he said, This is the word of the Lord, which he spoke by his servant Elisha the Tishbite. In the territory of Jezreel, the dog shall eat the flesh of Jezebel. And the corpse of Jezebel shall be as dung on the face of on the face of the field and the territory of Jezreel, so that no one can say, this is Jezebel. Jezebel was dressed to kill, or to use a play on words, dressed to be killed. Uh, some commentators think she was trying to seduce Jehu. Others think she was trying to just simply go out in style, looking like a queen. Whatever the case, Jezebel had been a great source of the evil and idolatry in Israel for many years. But it only took a moment to get rid of her. Jehu described her as a cursed woman. And in the end she received a death by rocks and stones as she fell off the, the wall and landed. This was the prescribed death for idolaters in Deuteronomy 13, 6-11. A fifth aspect of God's vengeance is that it comes as promised. Dale Ralph Davis commented that the Word of God serves as the catalyst of history. It's interesting where Jehu and Joram met. 
text brings out, they met on the land that once belonged to Naboth the Jezreelite. Remember that Ahab and Jezebel stole this property when Ahab covered it. Naboth said, it's my family possession, I don't want to sell it. And so Jezebel plotted and essentially murdered him. The day Ahab took possession of the land, Elijah was there waiting to pronounce the judgment we had read repeated in this text. First Kings 21. And Jezebel was eaten by dogs in fulfillment of the prophecy. While Jehu was feasting in the banqueting hall, the dogs were at their dinner. Shows that God always fulfills His word and brings justice at the proper time. Well, these same five characteristics we've considered in this passage, we could also see in terms of the final judgment. People don't think much about the wrath of God or the justice of God. The average person outside of Christianity, outside of the, uh, believing, is about as concerned about it as they are about green monsters living in the clouds. They just don't believe in them. And it are, if they do, they suppress thoughts of it and go on. But God's wrath against sin and evil is not a thing of the past. And there are times when He pours out His judgment in this world, and there are times when it is delayed to the next. Remember in Psalm 73, Asaph the psalmist struggled with the prosperity of the wicked. He said, surely in vain I've kept my heart pure, and I'm having trouble, and they prosper all over the place. And there are times when we might have the same thoughts. We see evil people in the world, and they seem to be doing fine and getting away with their evil. And some even die in that condition. And Asaph came to a resolution to his problem, his life. And look, look, at, over at, look over at Psalm 73. In verse 16 and following, Asaph's been speaking of this problem and says, When I thought about, thought how to understand this, it seemed to me a wearisome task. Until I went into the sanctuary of God, then I discerned, discerned their end. Great sermons Martin Lloyd-Jones preached on this psalm. He points out that he had a spiritual problem. It wasn't resolved in his mind yet, but he continued to worship. He went to the sanctuary of the Lord. And that's where he received the answer to his problem. Pastorally, I have talked with people through the years who have some spiritual difficulty, some theological problem, and their immediate response is, I'm not going to church, I'm not going to worship. I'm just going to back off for a while until I can solve this problem. And sadly, it's usually when people come into the sanctuary of God, hearing the Word of God preached, that often those solutions are given to them, or they come to a resolution of it. Verse 18, he says, here's the solution. Truly you set them in slippery places, you make them fall to ruin. How they are destroyed in a moment, swept away utterly by terrors, like a dream when one awakens, O Lord, when you rouse yourself to despise them as phantoms. When my soul was embittered, when I was pricked in heart, I was brutish and ignorant. I was like a beast toward you. Nevertheless, I am continually with you. You hold my right hand. You guide me with your counsel. And afterward, you receive me to glory. So I came to understand that even though they may prosper for a time, there is a final judgment. One of Calvin's commentaries, he said, there are some people that live their lives and God simp simply fattens them up for the day of slaughter. Very vivid imagery. Well, besides sometimes temporal judgments coming, of course there is a final judgment that is absolute and sure. And just like we saw in the case of the house of Ahab, the final judgment will be thorough. No one will escape from the judgment of Jesus in that day. And look with me over to 
Matthew chapter 25. Very important final judgment passage. In verse 31. Really, 31 to the end of the chapter is the whole section. Verse 31, When the Son of Man comes in His glory, and all the angels with Him, then He will sit on His glorious throne. Before Him He will gather all the nations, and He will separate people one from another, as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. And He will place the sheep on His right, and the goats on His left. Notice no one escapes. All the nations are before Jesus. After speaking to them in verse 41, then he will say to those on his left, the goats, Depart from me, you cursed, and the eternal fire prepared for the devil and his angels. We see in verse 45, speaking to the sheep, Then he will answer them, Truly I say to you, as you did did not do it to the least of these, did not do it to me. Oh, I'm sorry, speaking to the goats. In verse 46, and these will go away into eternal punishment, but the righteous into eternal life. And notice here is eternal punishment paralleled with eternal life of the redeemed. Two parallel ideas, an eternal ongoing punishment paralleled with eternal life. It will be thorough. 2 Corinthians 5.10 For we must all appear before the judgment seat of Christ, so that each one may receive what is due for what he has done in the body, whether good or evil. We see this judgment is personal. Each one will appear before the Lord. God is omniscient. Nothing escapes His knowledge. And we see at the very end of almost the end of the Bible, Revelation chapter 20. Again, a picture of His final judgment depicted in uh, more prophetic, apocalyptic form. In verses 11 and 12. Then I saw a great white throne and Him who was seated on it from His presence earth and sky fled away, and no place was found for them. And I saw the dead, great and small, standing before the throne, and books were opened. Then another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged by what was written in the books, according to what they had done. Again, speaking of God's knowledge, omniscience. And the sea gave up the dead who were in it. Death and Hades gave up the dead who were in them, the intermediate state. And they were, were judged, each one of them, according to what they had done. Again, notice personal judgment. And God's judgment, or vengeance, will be deadly. Jesus was concerned to warn people about the reality of hell and final judgment. Spoke of it, of course, in Matthew 25, we just read. Another passage in Matthew, Matthew chapter 10, verse 28. And Jesus uses very strong words when He describes the reality of hell and future judgment. Verse 28, Do not fear those who kill the body but cannot kill the soul. Rather fear him who can destroy both body and soul in hell. It's not meaning total destruction, annihilationism. We're talking about the idea of being cast there, coming to a state of ruin or final judgment. But notice he says, don't fear those who can kill the body. Well, think about all the things people can do to you in this life. A torture, a tax, and, and so forth. Don't fear that. Rather have a fear for God himself who will bring final judgment and vengeance. There is an eternal punishment for those outside of Christ. And God's judgment and vengeance will be perfectly just. In a human court, justice may be thwarted or perverted through lying witnesses or misinterpretation of facts. But since God is omniscient, He knows every motive of the heart, 
every action, every mitigating circumstance, and every opportunity a person has in their life. Therefore, he is able to render an absolutely perfect verdict. And in terms of final judgment, there are degrees of punishment in accordance with the degree of sin. It is a perfect judgment. God can certainly do that in His omnipotence. Just a few passages look for that. We're close to this. Look at Matthew chapter 11, verses 20 to 24. Then he, Jesus, began to denounce the cities where most of his mighty works had been done, because they did not repent. Woe to you, Chorazin! Woe to you, Bethsaida! That the mighty works done in you have been done in Tyre and Sidon, they would have repented long ago in sackcloth and ashes. But I tell you, it would be more bearable on the day of judgment for Tyre and Sidon than for you. And you, Capernaum, will you be exalted to heaven? You'll be brought down to Hades. For if the mighty works have been done in you, have been done in Sodom, it will remain until this day. But I tell you that it will be more tolerable for the day, in the day of judgment for the land of Sodom than for you. Now think how shocking that statement would have been to Jesus' Jewish audience at that time. I mean, Sodom is kind of the epitome of wickedness. You know, fire comes down from heaven and destroys the city it's so wicked. And Jesus said, here I am, God incarnate, in your midst, doing the greatest miracles ever seen on earth, hearing the, my voice directly, and you call me a demon, say I'm insane, attack me, plot against me, all those things, and it'll be more tolerable for Sodom in the day of judgment for, than for you who had rejected me. Boy, that's a striking statement. Another passage in Luke, Luke chapter 20. At the very end of that chapter. Verses 45 to 47. And in the hearing of all the people, he said to his disciples, Beware of the scribes who like to walk around in long robes and love greetings in the marketplaces and the best seats in the synagogues and the places of honor at feasts, who devour widows' houses and through our pretense make long prayers. They will receive the greater condemnation. And then finally, one more of uh, more than these that we could look at, but in Romans chapter 2, verses 4 through 6, Are you, do you presume on the riches of this kindness and forbearance and patience, knowing that God's kindness is meant to lead you to repentance? And that should be the rational response. The heart of fallen man apart from God's grace, but because you have your hard and impenitent heart, you are storing up wrath for yourself in the day of wrath, when God's righteous judgment will be revealed. He will render to each one according to his works. Remember Jesus said, don't you know, store up treasure on earth where you know, moth and rust destroy or thieves break in and steal. We store up treasure in heaven. Well, for God's people, we can store up treasure in heaven. For the lost, they can be storing up a treasure of wrath for the day of judgment. Now, God's judgment will be perfectly just, retributive justice. One final passage on God's justice in this regard is 2 Thessalonians. Verses 6 through 9. He mentions that they have been persecuted, they have been suffering. He said, Since indeed God considers it just to repay, repay with affliction those who afflict you, and to grant relief to you who are afflicted as well as to us, when the Lord Jesus is revealed from heaven with his mighty angels, 
in flaming fire, inflicting vengeance on those who do not know God and on those who do not obey the gospel of our Lord Jesus. They will suffer the punishment of the eternal destruction away from the presence of the Lord and from the glory of His might. Again, not meaning annihilation, but uh, an ongoing punishment state of that. But notice a retributive idea of justice taking place. And notice it is Jesus in His return that issues the justice. Revelation 6, it's the wrath of the Lamb, the Lord. You know, it's not just gentle Jesus, meek and mild. Here is the returning Lord in glory and power. Each person will get exactly what he deserves in sinning against a holy and righteous God. And the only way to escape is to have forgiveness for real guilt through faith in Jesus, through His work of the atonement on the cross, and His death and resurrection. Charles Colson had a little track he wrote called Free for Wife. He said that some time ago Albert Speer was interviewed about his last book on ABC's Morning, Good Morning America. Speer was Hitler's confidant whose technological genius was credited with keeping the factories humming throughout World War II. The only one of 24 war criminals to admit his guilt, Speer spent 20 years in Spandau prison. The interviewer, David Hartman, referred to a passage in one of Spears' earlier writings. You said that guilt can never be forgiven or shouldn't be. Do you still feel that way? Colson said, I will never forget the look on Spears' face as he responded. I served the sentence of 20 years. I could say I'm a free man. My conscience has been cleared by serving the whole time as punishment. But I can't do that. I still carry the burden of what happened to millions of people during Hitler's lifetime. I can't get rid of it. Hartman pressed the point, you really don't think you'll ever be able to clear it totally? Spear shook his head and sadly said, I don't think it's possible. Colson wrote, I wanted to write to Spear to tell him about Jesus and his death on the cross, about God's forgiveness, but there wasn't time. The ABC interview was the last public statement. He died shortly thereafter. And finally, this will happen just as God reveals and promises in Scripture. J.I. Packer wrote, when Christ comes again and history is completed, all humans of all ages will be raised for judgment and will take their place before God's judgment seat. The event is unimaginable, no doubt, but human imagination is no measure of what a sovereign God can and will do. This final judgment will be to the glory of God. And in this regard, it's interesting that the only place where the term hallelujah is used in the New Testament, of course it is Hebrew, a Hebrew term, but is in 19, in Revelation 19, verses 1 through 3. And in that text is where the wicked are being judged and God is receiving glory for that action. Revelation 19, 1 and 3. After this I heard what seemed to be the loud voice of the great multitude in heaven crying out, Hallelujah! Salvation and glory and power belong to our God, for His judgments are true and just, for he has judged the great prostitute who has corrupted the earth with her immorality, and he's avenged on her the blood of his saints. Once more they cried out, Hallelujah! The smoke from her goes up forever and ever. And the twenty-four elders and the four living creatures fell down and worshipped God, who was seated on the throne, saying, Amen! Hallelujah! And from the throne came the voice, saying, Praise our God, all you his servants who fear him, small and great. In this text, the wicked are being judged and God is being glorified. Now, when you think about this reality, you may be alarmed or awakened to your peril if you're not in Christ. You may be reminded of specific sins and wonder how you can stand before a holy and righteous God. If God's vengeance is thorough, deadly, just, and will surely come as promised, how can any of us escape judgment? and punishment. Well, we also see God's vengeance and judgment 
in the cross of Christ. How do we escape God's vengeance against every evil thought and motive, imagination, and action in our lives? Our only hope is to throw ourselves upon Jesus. Jesus took that judgment as a substitute for sinners on the cross. On the cross, the judgment of God against sin was poured out on Jesus. It was thorough, deadly, and just as sin was imputed to him. And he paid the price for, the, on, for those sins on the cross. Romans 3.25 mentions that he was set forth publicly as a propitiation by his blood. 1 John 4.10 says, And this was love, not that we have loved God, but that he loved us and sent his Son to be a propitiation for our sins, taking the wrath of God. The idea of propitiation is the idea of Jesus bearing that wrath, that judgment against us. I've heard sermons to describe the agony of crucifixion, and, and certainly that was a horrendous, torturous death. However, remember in the, the third hour that Jesus was on the cross, the sky grew black, and Jesus cried out in a loud voice, My God, my God, why have you forsaken me? First part of Psalm 22 prophetically points to Jesus' death and implies his victory as well. That moment the wrath of God against our sins was poured out on Jesus and he fulfilled every need associated with our salvation. The payment for our sin was complete. Back remember John records Jesus' word, last words as it is finished. Being basically the debt has been paid. It's accomplished. Romans 5, 6 to 11, the passage speaks about Jesus dying for us when we were helpless sinners, enemies of God. And God demonstrates his own love toward us and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And says much more. Having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from his wrath through our Lord Jesus Christ. It's a future tense. We will be saved from that future judgment of the wrath of God if we're in Christ. The text shows or demonstrates God's love toward us in the cross of Christ. And of course it goes further. If God loved us and Christ died through us when we were weak, ungodly sinners and enemies of God, how much more assured we can be of His love and mercy and care now when we're in Christ and redeemed and reconciled. If you believe in Jesus and trust in Him for your salvation, He has taken the thorough, deadly, and just vengeance of God against your sins. You can be assured that you will never come into condemnation. In fact, Romans 8, 1 promises that. There's no condemnation for those in Christ Jesus. In fact, condemnation is an utter impossibility for someone who believes in Jesus. And you can rest in and rely upon that. If you're not in Christ, if you don't believe in Jesus, God will render His full vengeance and justice against your sins in that day. Don't presume on another day of life. Repent now. Believe in Jesus now. A young man in Switzerland had been brought up in a Christian home where the Bible was revered. He'd heard the gospel repeatedly. But he refused to believe and became increasingly rebellious. Finally, as he came to age, he said, I'm sick of all this, and I'm going to look for a place where I can avoid Christians. His mother wept as he packed his suitcase and left home, and he boarded a train only to find that two passengers seated behind him were discussing the scriptures. <laughs> Not going to stay here. The next stop, he left the coach and entered a restaurant. And there, to his dismay, were some elderly ladies talking about Jesus and the return of the Lord. Knowing a ship was docked nearby, he decided, I'll just go out that way. So he got on the ship, going to another area, and trying to escape this religious chatter. And when the steamer embarked, he discovered it was filled with happy young students from a Bible academy. 
thoroughly disgusted, he made his way downstairs, found the bar, and the captain was there, and he approached the captain, and he said, Say, can you tell me where I can get away from all these cursed fanatical Christians? The captain looked at him and said, Yes, just die and go to hell. You won't find any Christians there. <laughs> but those startling words caused him to realize his eternal peril. And when he returned to home, he found peace and received in the Savior. Now he seeks to bring others to the Lord in his testimony. In thinking about this, one final word on this comes, I want to say, from James Montgomery Boyce. He gave the pastoral warning. He said, I tell you, as a minister of the Word of God, that the day is coming when you will stand in God's court. You will stand there in either one of two ways. Either you will stand clothed in the righteousness of Jesus, of Jesus Christ, as one for whom He died, whose sin and shame has been taken away, or you will stand in the horror of your own spiritual and moral nakedness, in shame, and you will be condemned for your sin. If you're not in Christ, come to Him now. Throw yourself upon Him. He's the only way of salvation. Let's pray. Father, we are grateful for the grace and the mercy that we have in Jesus. We are thankful that we don't have to stand condemned before you on that day if we are in Jesus. Pray for anyone here who may be struggling with assurance. They're truly saved, but struggle with the confidence and assurance that they truly belong to you. Pray that you would comfort their hearts. Give them a strong faith in what you had promised in your word. If there is anyone hearing this who is not a Christian, not a believer in Jesus, pray that you would open their eyes to these realities and the sureness of that final judgment which you had promised will come. Awaken them to that peril. Open their eyes to see the beauty the sweetness and the majesty of the cross of Christ and His resurrection and the grace that is there. In Jesus' name.